welcome to your region this week. I'm a Nandi Carroll Willoughby. We've got a packed show this week, so let's get started. Federal Finance Minister Bill Morneau was in Cambridge last week meeting the Greater kitchener waterloo Chamber of Commerce at the Cambridge Mill. Let's take a look at the meeting. I uh, have to say, coming to uh, the Kitchener-Waterloo region and seeing the Mayor of Kitchener and the Mayor of Waterloo sitting at the same table is almost as heartwarming as seeing the President of Sun Life Canada and Sun Life Manulife uh, sitting, sitting beside each other. There's a, there's a certain cooperative spirit, I guess, that goes on in this part of the country. I think my message today was, uh, was pretty clear. We, we recognize that uh, Canadians continue to worry about affordability. They continue to be anxious about the future. We've made significant investments in, uh, in Canadian success. We've gotten to a stage where we have the lowest unemployment rates we've seen in more than a generation. Uh, we're seeing uh, positive outcomes for businesses here in the Cambridge area and broader Kitchener, Waterloo area. But we know there's more to do. So our approach will be to continue to invest optimistically in Canadians' future. And uh, we recognize that the, the kind of approach that has been proposed by other parties is much less likely to invest and to ensure that we, we have Canadians' uh, future success in mind. We in, in Canada are in a very good position when you look at our competitiveness globally in terms of people that uh, go to post-secondary institutions. So college and university, we are, <coughs> we are at or near the top of OECD countries in terms of our uh, existing uh, education. However, there are places where we, we continue to have challenges and where we can do more. So um, I talked about our uh, focus on grants for, for uh, students undergraduate students at college and university. In our most recent budget, we also put in uh, additional grants for students at a graduate level. <clears throat> we actually do not have the same level of uh, graduate school and PhD uh, attainment as, uh, as we need to in, um, in Canada. And as compared to OECD countries, we are not a, yet a leader in that area. So that's a place where we need to focus, recognizing that in many of the uh, opportunities that will be coming out of a place like Kitchener-Waterloo, that higher level of education will be important. I think what you can expect from the Liberal government is that we're going to continue to invest optimistically in Canadians' future. The, the investments we've made have made an enormous difference. What you've seen with the Doug Ford government in Ontario, that conservative approach, we know that the Ford Shear approach will be not what we're going to do. We're going to invest in the future. They're focused on cuts and austerity. So I think there's going to be a stark choice. The choice that people are going to make, I hope, around the liberal approach is one that recognizes that what we've done over the last four years has demonstrably worked and we need to keep at it. Mo Monday's Guelph is a motivational speaking night at the Albion Hotel. Personalities from the region get a chance to speak their minds. Here's a look at the event. Mo Monday's Guelph uh, stands for Motivational Mondays. Um, and what we are are real people. <laughs> it says right here, we're real people telling real stories uh, about real inspiration. Um, so it's not something that's, that's uh, really preachy or really salesy. It's just people coming together and uh, we, every month we uh, get people who apply to tell their stories or a story, um, something personal to them that uh, sharing with an audience that would uh, be motivational. Mo Monday started in, in Toronto about seven years ago now um, and it's, it started, yeah, it was in Toronto, then now it's in, I believe it's 13 cities across the country. Um, there was a guy named Michel Nouret out in Toronto and he just wanted to get people together basically to tell their stories and I know that he started it out in a coffee shop and nobody showed up then he moved it to a bar and the place was packed and it just it grew from there. Uh, I got asked to be part of Mo Mondays uh, a few months ago we were trying to find a time and and Rob and Lisa asked me to speak tonight and uh, I was really happy to be involved it's a great great uh, promotional event I love the the whole concept of it my sp my uh, speech tonight is going to be called how I learned to talk and it's how I made the transition from kind of your standard office job and just doing some public speaking and TV work, public address work on the side to how I actually made that my career and what I do. And a lot of it is actually, you know, touching on how I started at Rogers TV, starting as a volunteer and becoming a hockey host for OHL and everything else I've done. I have seven, eight different contracts now that pay me to talk into a microphone, which is pretty cool. Um. I actually didn't know that much about it till I was uh, 
asked if I would participate. And then uh, when I dug a little deeper to find out what they're all about, it, it's kind of all about what I'm all about. It seemed like a very nice match. I've been asked to be the musical guest this evening, uh, although I could have easily done a boring speech instead. <laughs> so because of I looked at the themes we're looking at and the stories, I've decided to do what I, the musical part of it sort of in a way that would fit into that as much as possible. If you want to speak at Mo Mondays and speak on our stage, you can go to our website, momondays.com forward slash Guelph and apply and uh, we will send you an application where uh, later on in the autumn or early in 2020, you could be on our stage. Your region this week. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back. 570 News' Mike Farwell speaks with Alan Quarry on the Heart Beats Hate initiative and how we can reduce gun violence in the region. In our community, it's called Heart Beats Hate, and its founder is Alan Quarry, who joins us to talk about it this morning. Mr. Quarry, good of you to share your time with us. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> good morning, Michael. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me, and thanks for... Uh, having us have the opportunity to talk about Heartbeats Hate. I've noticed it so much more visibly. You and I have had the chance to talk about it in the past. I proudly have a button that I can wear <laughs> that, that shows the logo and, and bears the insignia, Heartbeats Hate. I've been yeah. seeing signs now across the community as well. Yes, and that initiative has just started. Um, we're very happy about how people are participating um, with the lawn signs. And uh, they're, they're picking them up uh, at my office in uh, St. Jacobs, uh, or I'm out there um, putting them up, up along uh, roadside, roadsides. And, yeah, it, it's all about um, this being a movement. Um, this is about getting people to understand uh, or to reinforce their already uh, understanding that hate is a choice, that y you just don't have to be... Uh, a jerk. Um, there you go. That's what it is. Don't be a jerk. <laughs> I think I should have some signs printed up with that too. But you know, we we're living in an age, as you said, that the, it, it, we're kind of lacking right now in civility, in um, you know, empathy for others. We're we seem to be, uh, whether it's due to um, politics or due to religion or due to whatever. We're taking sides very quickly, um, and if you're going to be making a choice, what Heartbeats Hate is all about is make the choice to be, you know, uh, chill out a little bit, uh, be kinder, um, have some empathy. If you see somebody being bullied, um, you know, step in or talk the other person down. It is very much about standing up, speaking out, and pushing back. And I think that's important. If we just let this go and it gets normalized, oh, my goodness, Mike, uh, that would be the worst thing uh, possible. We have to push back. Um, the people that just let it happen um, are actually then accomplices um, and, and enablers to people who are pushing a, a hate-based agenda. So uh, that, that's what it's all about. And and uh, we're seeing people pick up on the idea, the, on the concept, and that's all we wanted to do, really. 519 Sports Online covered the lacrosse final between Fergus and Brantford. Let's see how the game played out. 
The Fergus Thistles with a chance to advance to the Meredith Cup Championship Series on Tuesday night. The Thistles coming into Game 4 with a 2-1 series lead over the Brantford Warriors who were trying to keep their season alive. Three minutes in, watch number three. Sam McDonald wins the battle along the boards. He scoops it up. He spins and he scores from long distance. Sammy Mack opens the scoring. Fergus takes a 1-0 lead. At the other end, DJ Martins to Connor Merritt, and Captain Connor gets the Warriors on the board. That's his sixth goal of the playoffs. We are tied at one. Later, how about this effort by Nick Aitchison? This kid has been unbelievable in these playoffs, and he gives Fergus the lead. They are up 2-1. Second period, the game is now tied, and it's Xavier D. Michelle delivering. Huge save on Trevor McDonald who was all by himself still to all but a few minutes later Dalton Thomas comes out of the corner runs to the slot and gives Brantford their first lead of the night it's 3-2 Warriors but the Thistles answer 36 seconds later Nick Aitchison on the near side with a wire job to the back of the net we are tied at three later it's now 4-4 Nick D'Amico with a break Nick D'Amico with a goal. He puts it home, putting Brantford back on top. And before the period is over, Connor Merritt with a nice pass to Ryan Dore, and he puts the Warriors up by a pair. Brantford is leading 6 4 after 40 minutes. Let's go to the third, and it was all Thistles. Cameron Angst to Trenton Hitchcock in front. That's his second marker of the postseason. Fergus is down by one. Then it's two quick goals from Brody Schaefer. First, he rips one in on the far side. We are tied at six, and 44 seconds after that, Schaefer drives, and he gives the Thistles the lead. Fergus coming out on fire in the third. They are up 7-6. A few minutes later, Thistles power play. Nick Aitchison scores his fourth goal of the night, and he now has... 30 goals in 11 playoff games. Can you say MVP? More Thistles offense. Brody Schaefer rips one and scores. Fergus with six goals in the final frame. They pull away in the third. And as time expires, the Thistles storm off the bench to celebrate. They are going to the Meredith Cup Junior C Championship Series. Fergus wins game four, 10-7 over the Warriors. And they take the series three games to one. And it's becoming a tradition. The Thistles chanting their captain's name during 519 post-game interviews. Here is Adam Launce after Tuesday night's big victory. Everyone believes in this room and uh, we believe and we battled back hard and we came back and we just won that period and it was a great experience and uh, you know I've been here for five years and I finally did it you know my fifth and final year I finally did it. Job's not done yet we want that Meredith Cup. We got one more freaking round to go. <laughs> Back to the chairs, back to the chairs. Oh, I have this feeling right now with them dancing. Oh, it's, cra yeah, baby. <laughs> it's crazy, you know? I get the chills every time, you know? Your region this week continues right after this. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Last week, the city of Stratford held a drowning prevention demonstration to show what to do in case of an emergency. So the purpose of our event is to, to promote National Drowning Prevention Week. So we want to promote water safety here at the pool and at home. And obviously in an event of a major emergency, the emergency response teams respond to help us carry forth saving the victim. So we want to promote the conversation of our duty in an emergency situation and their duty with us. We teach our kids to um, identify bystanders. So if you need someone to call 911, you're identifying them specifically um, so then people feel responsible and they feel like they have something to do. It's a good distraction when people are shocked or in a 
very traumatic situation and it makes the communication open and always making sure that people are coming back after they've done their tasks um, and then just making sure that you're calling 911 and getting the right information on their way um, and making sure you have eyes on the scene if you're like the primary responder. Okay, I'm here to the side so that they can assess the victim's airways. I was doing a breathing check and breaths. We always start with breaths when we're rescuing a victim out of the water. Declan's starting CPR to resuscitate the victim. Yeah, so the city's website has information about how to become a lifeguard. Um, you can come chat with us here, but the Life Saving Society, their website is great for introduction to swimming and how to become a lifeguard. Same with the Red Cross, they both have programs that introduce those concepts and let you know what, where courses are running and stuff like that. Yeah, I think it's a super important skill and I think that everybody should be prepared because you don't know what to expect and you don't know where you'll be if in case of emergency. So we recommend any kid who's moving through lessons do our bronze levels to learn CPR because you never know if you'll be in a situation where a friend drowns or when you're in the future with kids. All right, so they swim an organization in Cambridge has started a new sports discovery camp allowing children to explore different sports. We met with the organizers of the camp and the response they've been getting. So um, our organization actually has sorry, has, has a history in, uh, we run summer camps actually based on something called STEM camp based on science, technology, engineering and math. And based on especially the campers and also the counselors that we're hiring, we felt that there was a need of, of a new type of camp. Uh, our, our management actually have a history of sports background as well as in STEM. And we thought that we wanted to create a type of camp that could teach some more people skills, the kind of things that we were seeing somewhat lacking in some of the uh, students that we were hiring as well as some of the campers that were coming. So our founder and CEO, Kevin Kugler, he came up with this idea of creating a, a sports camp that we would create activities that would uh, teach these people skills like teamwork and communication, but do it through sports so the kids would be active, having a good time. Um, another thing that uh, he found that was uh, that was a real need for, he was finding that uh, statistically, when kids hit around 10, 11, 12 years old, uh, of age, many of them would actually stop participating in sports because it wasn't fun anymore. And we wanted to try and find a venue where they could have fun playing sports, and it's so important for them to stay active and to try and, and once they find a sport they can enjoy, hopefully one that they can play for the rest of their life, um, that they would be active, and so it, it has a kind of a dual purpose. We actually have uh, up to 15 sports based on location. Um, many of the very common sports, like we do, do basketball and baseball, uh, soccer, um, and so forth. But we also decided to introduce some uh, unique sports, uh, like ultimate frisbee. Uh, we play, also uh, have one called spike ball. Um, we and in the places where we have facilities, we have pickleball, and those are all sports that kids probably at a young age have not been uh, exposed to, and maybe they can find enjoyment in it as well. But we do have uh, uh, 15 sports in our camp. It feels really good, you know, to give back to the community, especially the kids who look up to you. So being here as role models, I think it's very important. It's the greatest feeling ever. Um, it's awesome. Like, that's the whole basis of the camp is to provide them with the ability to learn all the different things about sports and also learn how they can use sports to better themselves. It, it's really exciting for us uh, as this is a new venture for us this is our first year and of course when you're trying something new you're never quite sure how it's going to turn out and uh, you also learn every time that uh, you do something so this is also a learning experience but uh, the feedback we've had so far has been tremendous that the kids are enjoying it because they're doing something different every day they are being active and I'm not sure if they're noticing that they're learning something but they're they're coming home and after having a fun day outside if, you, if your kids are wanting to find a, a, an enjoyable thing to, to come out and do for the for a week, I think this is a tremendous uh, opportunity. One other thing that uh, we also offer is um, we actually give the kids a chance to uh, make their own game. So that way they can try and create a new sport as well. So there's even we try to add some creativity to that too. Your region this week will be right back after these messages.
Welcome back. Hockey Night in Brantford is set for Wednesday, August 14th. Phil McCollman held a press conference to announce that the funds will be donated to Crossing All Bridges. Well, Crossing All Bridges Learning Centre is a centre that provides day programming for adults living with developmental disabilities. We service people who have Down syndrome or on the autism spectrum or have acquired brain injury. We make sure every day they learn, connect and grow through a series of programming. We keep them fit in our beautiful fitness room and of course our new gymnasium. Uh, we were started in 2003 by four founding mothers themselves parents of adults living with developmental disabilities who had nothing to do when they aged out of the school at 21 years old. So we've been in operation now for 16 years and for most of those 16 years in lease facilities and this past year, well actually on May 4th, 2018, we launched a capital campaign called Connections, uh, connecting to all of our friends in the community to raise the money to purchase and acquire a home of our own and we've been just so fortunate to land at the old St. Bernard School on 65 Sky Acres Drive and uh, the money raised for Hockey Night in Brantford is going directly to the purchase and upgrade of that school and we couldn't be happier. First of all it starts out the night before with a charity auction that Dave Levac has been chairing and uh, there's some fantastic items to be had that we've got donations from Blue Jays, the Toronto Maple Leafs, from the sports side but we've also had a lot of local businesses give us some very lovely items which we're going to auction off the night before at the Brantford Golf and Country Club. And then we head into August the 14th, the Wednesday and on that day we start the festivities here at the Gretzky Centre uh, at 5 o'clock with a public skate. So the people who buy tickets to the game for themselves and their children, and by the way, tickets are very affordable at $10 for adults, $5 for children. They'll get to go out and skate with the players who they're going to see play in the evening, including four NHL, current NHL players who will be dressing up and playing and captaining our teams. And so it's a very exciting uh, hour of skating. Uh, uh, with the with the players, and then uh, we will the players will go in. They'll dress up for the game. We'll start at about 6:30 with warm-ups, and then uh, the official program will start at 6:45, quarter to seven. Seven o'clock, we drop the puck, and we play basically a one-hour game with one intermission, two periods of hockey. Very entertaining. It turns out that they can't hold back their competitive instincts, so you'll see some very good hockey being played. Uh, uh, the, uh, by the players taking pride in the fact that they're on the ice and they are the local people who've made it to the elite levels or, or are coming up to the elite levels with a few, I, I would say, uh, NHL alumnus sprinkled in there and other professional players sprinkled into the rosters. It's a fantastic roster this year. Then we raise a bunch of money for uh, crossing all bridges uh, to keep individuals uh, advanced and, and learning and, and, and motivated and useful uh, and assisting the parents uh, with the, the, the difficulty of raising an adult uh, with uh, disabilities. That's all for another episode of Your Region This Week. For more information on the show or if you have any story ideas, visit our website rogerstv.com and fill out the proposal form at the bottom. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week.